Welcome everyone to today's Client Success Forum with Arconic Corporation. And my name is Kathy Halliday, and I am the Senior Alliance Director at Argano Interrel. And I will be helping moderating today's call. With that, I'd like to introduce Argano Interrail's CEO, Edward Morosky. Edward, take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I'm in beautiful Arlington, Texas, known worldwide as the place where both the Texas Rangers and the Dallas Cowboys lose all of their home playoff games. <clears throat> but on a happier note, I have known uh, today's presenter for wow, over a decade. He's been a longtime uh, devotee and supporter of Hyperion, but he is never shy about voicing his true feelings, and I say that with love. It's been great watching him rise up through the financial ranks at Arconic over the years. He has a combination, which you will experience, of intelligence, personality, but also expertise. It's shown bright not only at Arconic, but truly across all of Pittsburgh. As manager of financial applications, he is truly the driver of Arconic's entire journey to the cloud. It is my pleasure, no, it is my honor Introduce the guy who puts the base in S-Base, the hype in Hyperion, and the man in performance management, my friend and soon yours, the magnificent Mike Bosco. Thank you, Edward and Kathy. Uh, let me do a sound check. Can you hear me? Sounds awesome. Great. I'll begin with a brief introduction. Unlike Edward in beautiful Arlington, I'm speaking to all of you from chilly Pittsburgh. Uh, where I am currently part of Arconic Corporation's corporate IT organization uh, as manager of financial applications. I've been a part of the organization since March of 2000 and in and around the Hyperion Solutions specifically for the most part since 2009. Uh, it is my privilege to be asked by Argano Interrel to speak today. Uh, it was advertised as a chance to hear about our journey to the EPM cloud decision and beyond. And journey is the best word. Uh, it has been a long road to get here. Uh, it will be challenging and fun for me to relive it all in less than an hour. Uh, I'm sure each of you are in a different place in your journey, so I'm going to try to cover the whole journey. But by the end of the hour, I hope everyone on the call has gotten something out of the time. I'll have to go fast to cover all the ground, so fasten your seat belts and keep your arms and legs inside the Zoom meeting at all times. A couple of quick programming notes. Uh, I'm not quite fully recovered from some cold symptoms. I may occasionally have to pause uh, to clear my throat. I'll try to mute, mute the phone when I do that. I apologize profusely. I didn't ask in, uh, Interrail to, to postpone this meeting uh, because I thought I'd be fully recovered by now. Uh, but I just wanted to mention so you didn't think that there was an audio problem if you lose me for a second or two here or there. Uh, second programming note, uh, Argano Interrail violates the three syllable maximum for any company name that you have to say more than 10 times in a one hour presentation. Uh, so apologies to all my friends at Argano Interrail, but for the next hour, you're going to be back to just Interrail uh, so that I can finish the presentation in an hour. Besides, you were Interrail for most of our journey together anyway. Uh, let me start very quickly with just a, a, an Arconic commercial, right? So if you're not familiar with Arconic, Arconic is a leading provider of aluminum sheet, plate, and ex extrusions as well as innovative architectural products. Our most recent annual report shows that we've got about 13,400 employees globally, uh, 22 major manufacturing operations. Our 2020 revenue was 5.7 billion. Uh, ground transportation provides uh, the most of our revenue, but we also get significant revenue from industrial, building and construction, aerospace and packaging. And I would encourage you to read and learn more about Arconic at www.arconic.com. Let me begin with some foundational information that will make more sense as, as the conversation continues, right? So it's important to understand that we have been Hyperion users for a long time. Uh, we implemented our first components all the way back in 2004. And the, the, the best thing that we brought into that first implementation 
was a standardized corporate chart of accounts. And we've always governed that chart of accounts with a tight process. So the COA is managed centrally by financial accounting. Uh, the consolidation team and FP&A work closely together on the formal requests that come in and the update process. Uh, they coordinate timing and activities with the Hyperion technical support team. And our chart of account changes are done on a monthly or quarterly basis, uh, never ad hoc. Uh, and it's also worth mentioning that uh, nothing ever gets deleted. Uh, our, our chart of accounts is in many ways a, a museum or a, a graveyard, depending on how you want to look at it. We were such early adopters of Iperion that there wasn't even a metadata management solution back then. We worked with a local consulting firm uh, to create an Oracle Forms-based custom metadata management solution that worked so well, uh, we were still using it going into this EPM project. So throughout the 2000s, we were reacting to requirements as they came. So we built Hyperion into a data flow where our global data warehouse sits between our regional EBS general ledgers and what I'll say both sides of Hyperion. So both HFM where we do our consolidations, eliminations, adjustments and corrections, as well as our uh, planning and S space, which is where we do our monthly forecasting and annual planning. We didn't necessarily build with a 10 year vision. Again, we just reacted and built what we thought we needed as the need arose. And I'll come back to that point a little bit later. On the reporting side, always been heavy smart view users, mostly use the Excel smart view for our Hyperion based reporting. Uh, we dabbled a little bit in web analysis, never really got off the ground with financial reports. And eventually we had quite a showcase of financial cues. Input, reporting, ASO, BSO, you name it. We, we had financial cubes that collectively covered balance sheet, income statement, uh, cash flow, statistics, including CapEx, headcount shipments, uh, key financial metrics, including EBITDA, uh, days working capital, uh, COGS as, <coughs> excuse me, as a percent of sales and many, many operational metrics. We were proud of what we built. Uh, we considered it an investment worth getting the most out of as long as possible to the point we rarely upgraded it. And when we did, the business case was supported mostly by software configuration management considerations or staying on a version supported by Hyperion and, and then Oracle. Uh, there were many factors, but truth be told, we just upgraded to the EPM cloud from version 11.1.2.2 of planning and S-Base. I'll let you research for yourselves how old that version is. Although it was still Oracle supported the whole time we were on it. So by 2018, we had to accept that there were three major changes that had taken place since our initial solution had matured. First, our company had changed significantly. I don't wanna spend a whole lot of time on this, but just very briefly, in case you're not aware, our Conic Corporation was actually a result of a company separation of our Conic Incorporated and Halmet Aerospace and our Conic Incorporated was actually the result of, of a separation of Alcoa Inc. into Arconic Inc. Uh, and Alcoa Corp. So it was time to re-engineer and rescale our solution. Secondly, because we upgraded, not since 2013, uh, we, we were missing out on years worth of new features and functionality that we believed had to bring value to our solution. And finally, the technology had shifted to the cloud. We had an admitted bias toward cloud, not only for the alignment with our corporate strategy, but also because the aforementioned technical upgrades were lengthy, costly, and quite honestly, disruptive. Uh, the cloud evergreen model would shift that whole paradigm, <coughs> excuse me, and prevent us from falling behind like this again. So we went on a mission 
And our mission simply was to transform our Connex finance processes, leveraging leading practice to streamline and automate planning, forecasting, reporting analysis, and metadata management techniques. But we knew we needed guidance to do that. I mean, after all, we were busy running our company for 15 years, not staying on top of the leading practices in, in any specific area. So we sent out a request for a proposal and ultimately we chose Interrail. And I'll just summarize why by saying that all aspects of the Interrail response to our RFP showed that they were most closely aligned with what we thought a strategic assessment was. They got what we were looking for. So, so what did we get out of the strategic assessment? Uh, to summarize what 29 Arconic and Interrail, Interrail participants accomplished in 13 workshops. We got a full capability assessment that gave us a current state summary, high level process map, and a recognition of what was working well for Arconic and where there were improvement opportunities. Uh, from that, we were able to derive upgrade objectives and corresponding payoffs, as well as what concerns and challenges there would exist in the transformation. But best of all, I think all of that insight was tool agnostic. In other words, to that point, we really didn't talk any specific tool. It was really more about just process and, and people. But Interrail did help us identify the EPM cloud modules that we would need to meet our objectives if we chose Oracle, as well as a, an Oracle three-year roadmap with high-level timelines, resource plans, even training plan recommendations. And, and finally, Interrail left us with key decisions and next steps to think about. That strategic assessment gave us enough meaningful insight to reach out to our Oracle sales manager who led us through their discovery process where we aligned on the transformation requirements, critical success factors and deployment approach. Uh, we got EPM cloud demonstrations. Uh, we uh, set up, they set up uh, benchmark customer conversations for us uh, and helped us achieve a stakeholder alignment. Now, we were certainly aware, as all of you probably are, that, that Oracle has competitors in this space, but we ended up choosing Oracle EPM Cloud for a few key reasons. First, we are an Oracle shop. Our, our corporate ERP, as I said earlier, is Oracle EBS. Uh, we have Oracle's HR cloud solution. And so we felt that staying with Oracle would pay off tech technologically and commercially immediately and down the road in ways that we could predict and maybe even some that we couldn't. Secondly, we were drawn to Oracle positioning EPM to be business process oriented, not product oriented. So essentially one product skew of interconnected capabilities. So Oracle was shifting away from individual cloud services to one interconnected solution that supported four main business processes planning, financial close, uh, reporting, and enterprise data management. Lastly, and maybe most importantly, the, the impression we were getting was that the competitor products had some capabilities on par with EPM, but maybe not across all of the business processes. We didn't want to try to cobble together a solution comprised of different products. From a total cost of ownership standpoint, we didn't want one tool for forecasting and planning, another for closing consolidation, another for tax, another for reporting and dash morning, and then worst of all, a library of integrations holding it all together that were a nightmare to maintain. We felt Oracle gave us the most homogeneous solution, although full disclosure, we did not do our own proof of concept with other products. We just didn't have the manpower to do that and still get off of our on-premise version uh, before it became unsupported. There was one last important piece of the puzzle, however. Interrail suggested we take a look at one cloud 
for our project integration needs. We weren't using OneCloud and really weren't familiar with them, uh, but, but all this time later, we're still glad we did. OneCloud can be an enterprise ETL tool, but for the context of our project, they have connectors that they call biz apps that we needed, which were great accelerators uh, in developing the integrations part of our solution. The product itself, as well as the support we've received from OneCloud have both been very good. And I'll just mention as an FYI, that if you decide to do some research into OneCloud, Workiva recently acquired OneCloud. So don't be surprised if you come across that uh, in your research. One final but important scope decision before beginning the project, HFM and Financial Closing Consolidation, FTC, FCC. Arconic has and has had for a long time uh, a monthly closing consolidation process that we feel is world-class. There isn't really a need to engineer it, so we asked Interrel to lead a proof of concept with us to reveal how well our current process mapped to FCC. Though the exercise had a great degree of success, had some degree of success, we decided to keep HFM out of the phase one EPM cloud scope. The phase one scope was already aggressive. It was going to be a challenge to complete it in the time frame that we had. And given the importance of the monthly close and consolidation process, we thought it was prudent to take planning and forecasting and reporting there first and build on that success story later with HFM. So in parallel with the EPM project in 2001, we upgraded HFM on-premise to 11.2.4, but it's important to note that the, the two projects were not independent. As I mentioned earlier, we have one common chart of accounts that's now managed or was going to be managed in EDMCS. So our on-premise HF, HFM solution is now using EDMCS also. And we had to upgrade from Oracle Data Integrator. It's no longer supported in the on-prem version of HFM that we went to. So our HFM solution is now using OneCloud for all integrations as well. Uh, Arconic will revisit FCC in a future EPM phase. On a side note, Arconic has Hyperion Tax Provisioning Solution, but we just implemented HTP two years ago and it doesn't yet have automated integrations. So already having a modern tax provisioning solution that was still standalone, uh, we never gave it serious phase one scope consideration. At some point in the future though, we, we certainly can. So our EPM solution was going to be built around a few important and critical EPM components, namely EDMCS, EPBCS, PCMCS, and OAC. We went into the project with some overarching tenets of the initiative. And what we aimed to do could really be summarized in the following, oh, half a dozen or so bullets. We wanted to drive standardization and consolidate what had become fragmented forecasting, planning, and actual processes. So just to elaborate on that a little bit, as I said before, when we started in 2004 for Hyperion, we, we put an initial implementation in place and then reacted as requirements presented themselves. But what, really, what that really did was it kind of left us with a fragmented solution. So for example, we had users who had to enter forecast information into to multiple two, three cubes uh, and, and so, of course, the supporting detail wasn't in all in one place, if it was even in Hyperion. Uh, they would oftentimes pull all of their forecast information across all those cubes down, back down into Excel anyway, uh, and then they would enrich that data and, and move forward with it. And so we really wanted to, 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 to rein that in and drive standardization and consolidation across that. We wanted to make Hyperion the source of the truth. Uh, we wanted to move from having Hyperion, you know, just be the final, we wanted to move from having Hyperion just be the final data destination 
to instead be a tool where the work is done to build the supporting detail and the final answer. We wanted to reduce our dependency on complex Excel spreadsheets, models, manual consolidation rollups, and reports. We wanted to deploy driver-based forecast processes so we could more rapidly respond to changing business conditions and market volatility. We wanted to reduce the effort to run long-term strategic models, which up till now were, were done in Excel. And we wanted to enable more self-service reporting for casual users, but still provide flexibility for our power users. It's, it's the beginning of 2001. We are energized. We have executive sponsorship, a scope, high level, of, high level objectives. We own a product. We chose an implementation partner. And Interrail began the engagement with what they call the ideation phase. In the ideation phase, the project team was introduced, project ground rules were agreed upon, the interrail engagement methodology was reviewed, <coughs> functional requirements, detailed functional requirement workshops were held. Uh, interrail actually brought up our Oracle EPM environment for us, uh, developed initial prototypes, drove the, a, a final technical design, uh, scoped out the cost and timing of the build test deploy phase, and we agreed on what our measures of success would be. Uh, these ideation outputs were included in the statement of work that we had with Interrail for that next phase, along with deliverables, customer responsibilities, assumptions, you know, the other typical statement of work kind of things. And we would build our solution running parallel tracks. So those tracks would be EDM, integrations, strategic modeling, planning, PCM, management reporting, and analytics and dashboarding. Something else to share at this point, even if you select a third-party implementation partner, such as Interrail, Oracle can provide a customer success manager who oversees what is called the cloud implementation success program. Essentially, that provided our project team with four key interactions with the appropriate Oracle team members. Uh, project launch, uh, design document review, system performance validation, and a production readiness assessment. In addition, Oracle provided a senior technical support engineer for EPM Cloud who led a dedicated support team committed to providing Arconic a streamlined SR logging experience throughout. It still took almost a full year. <laughs> but in late October, we did migrate to production uh, an EPM solution. But I wanna make sure you understand that we're still running our legacy solution in parallel because we wanted to, there to be some overlap time to make sure that we have full confidence in the new system. Uh, was the functionality correct was the, or the mathematics correct from a usability standpoint, performance standpoint? E essentially, we wanted to make sure that EPM became the official system of record once the, the, the environment had stabilized. We, we do feel like we have a, a more consolidated solution of interconnected capabilities. And, and I won't have time in a short session like this to explain the entire solution, but just to kind of give you a flavor for it, we now have one financial cube for our business units. So in that cube, we have balance sheet forms and rules, income statement forms and rules, cash flow forms and rules, statistics forms and rules, including CapEx, headcount and shipments, and, and some other forms and rules. We now have one financial uh, cube for our resource units. It's also an input cube where the resource units could, can, can use expense forms and rules for GA and SE, 
PAE, COGS, R&D, and even some headcount forms and rules. And we now have one reporting cube for finance. That reporting cube contains our actuals, including 10 years of history. It contains our forecast and plan, both archived and current, and some member formula accounts. And that business unit and that resource unit finance cubes push to the reporting cubes. So you can see as we've started to bring it all back together in something uh, that's much more efficient. Again, we're still running in parallel. Uh, we, we won't do that much longer. We're about ready to cut over to EPM officially. But I do wanna share with you what, what is the value that we expect or hope to get from EPM you know, when we finally pull the plug on our legacy system. And, and I guess we can categorize that in, in probably half a dozen different ways. And in, in no particular order, I'll share some of that with you. So in the forecasting and planning space, right, we expect to now have a unified forecasting and planning platform uh, that combines the current disparate processes. Uh, that platform will support both trend-based forecasting as well as direct entry, uh, multi-currency forecast entry with automatic translation to US dollar is a feature. Uh, supporting detail and forecast comments can easily now be added by the forecasters. And we have multiple sandbox versions available for business-driven what-if scenarios. Under the category of chart of accounts maintenance, uh, we now have a cloud-based enterprise data management systems to manage our common chart of accounts. It will handle both common elements as well as additional dimensions, be able to feed metadata to Oracle EPM cubes and HFM, and, and even support other non-Oracle applications uh, as an enterprise data management solutions should. Uh, in the category of supplemental actuals, uh, we're, we expect to be able to submit various business-defined metrics and non-financial indicators into Oracle EPM that are not sourced from the general ledger, and that will provide the businesses more flexible timing versus the traditional stat accounts, uh, which are required to be submitted on a tighter time frame. In the long-range planning and strategic modeling space, we now have a dedicated to tool to support entry, analysis, and reporting of our five-year strategic plan. Uh, we can include and model various what-if situations like M&A, divestitures, and major investment initiatives. And, and it provides a framework for handling special situation models such as COVID. From a reporting and analytics standpoint, you know, that, that financial reporting cube will now provide actuals and forecasts for consolidated Arconic, BU, plant and resource unit level uh, reporting. So again, this is just a, a flavor of the, the value that we hope and expect to, to realize uh, now that we are in production. A few more things worth mentioning before I, I, I end the, the presentation portion. So Arconic has pivoted to the Oracle ACS organization to provide application support for our EPM solution. The Oracle ACS organization was not involved in the project. <coughs> However, uh, they are now helping us to support. So kind of think of them in terms of, you know, break, fix, problem resolution, such as, uh, you know, a level two help desk. Uh, but more than that, also maintenance support, such as regression testing for our monthly patch updates, uh, critical process management, measurement and monitoring, uh, integration and extension management and monitoring, you know, we had experience with ACS uh, from, from our HR cloud solution. Uh, having them along simplifies our help chain, uh, streamlines our issue escalations across Oracle. Uh, it fills expertise, gap, expertise gaps. After all, we're, we're still new to this EPM world, uh, and, and they're going to help us fill those gaps. And, and bottom line, it pr protects our new investment. So that engagement is off to a good start. Uh, they're, they're very uh, engaged in, in the knowledge transfer. They ask good questions. Uh, they're eager to, eager to learn and, and help us. Lessons learned. Everybody loves to, to hear about lessons learned at the end of a journey like this. This is where I get to keep it real. The first one I'll share is you cannot overestimate the importance of change management. 
Interrail will offer assistance in the area of change management uh, if, if you're working or, or plan to work with them. Uh, we, we tried to attack change management from the Arconic side in several different ways, right? We involved key users in, in requirements gathering all the way back to the strategic assessment. Uh, we certainly involved uh, the users in the testing phase. There was a lot of training that was done. Even running in parallel, having an overlap from legacy to, to EPM, it, it was partly done for change management reasons. We, we certainly wanted to give the user base a chance to get comfortable uh, with the tool before it was the only one they had available to them. Um, it, it's still very difficult. Again, you really can't uh, you know, overestimate uh, the, the, the change management effort required, especially when you're talking about a solution like ours that had existed uh, for such a long time. The second thing I'll, I'll share in lessons learned is uh, the Interrail team mentioned more than once that compared to other clients that they had worked with in the past, that Arconic's key stakeholders were making themselves available to the Interrail team much more frequently uh, than is typical. And, and that's great. Right, I mean, that, that, that illustrated how important this initiative was to our organization. Uh, but to be fair to Interrail, it wasn't a case where we could dictate all of our requirements to them. Part of that was because of the aforementioned company separations, but you know, we had some gaps in our, in our own uh, understanding, right? We, we had everybody covering all the processes and we had everybody who understood you know, how to execute all the processes but we didn't necessarily have, after all these years and two company separations, the people who designed and built the legacy solution and, and, and knew to the nth level of detail, you know, how it worked and why it worked that way. And so we, we did have to ask Interrail to help us reverse engineer some of our current solution to help us figure out what the new solution would look like. So, so maybe we had to make ourselves available a lot, but, but we did. And, and so I would emphasize make the right people available as much as possible uh, to, uh, to your project team uh, to have the best chance of staying on track and being successful. The next lesson learned I would share is in the area of EDMCS. Uh, I would uh, encourage you to keep EDMCS off of the critical path. Um, it was a, a parallel track, as I mentioned earlier, well, uh, but quite honestly, if we could have, we probably would have uh, addressed it sooner and, and, and first to make sure that it was a fully vetted solution uh, before uh, you know, it became a, a, an issue in some of the other tracks where, for example, you know, data and metadata wasn't quite available uh, when it needed to be uh, to keep those tracks on pace. So, so I, I would, I would uh, give, give extra special attention to that if, if that's part of your solution. Uh, the next lesson learned I would share with you is that um, Performance testing, very, very important. Uh, early and often, even as soon as the, the, the design is finished. Um, since our late October go live, we, we have had uh, some areas where, uh, you know, performance hasn't quite been, you know, where we wanted it to be. Um, Nobody wants a shiny new cloud system to even operate at the same speed as the old system, let alone slower, right? So just to give you one example there, right? Smart push is wonderful, uh, but not if it takes minutes <laughs> instead of seconds. And so, you know, there's some areas we've made improvements, but there's some other areas that we're, we're still, you know, thinking of, of making some improvements. And I guess the last lesson learned, um, I'm not sure how to apply this one, but, we happened to buy our EPM subscriptions right after Oracle went to Gen 2 of the EPM product. I don't even think we realized that. But as we got into the project and having an experienced Interrail team, they were able to spot that some things didn't work the same way in Gen 2, or in some cases, they didn't work at all uh, because maybe the, the Gen 2 wasn't fully vetted yet. Uh, just to give you one example, we talked about Oracle Analytics Cloud OAC uh, being a centerpiece of our solution. Uh, when we finally decided to, <coughs> to, to turn our attentions to OAC, uh, there was a, an issue with OAC connecting to the rest of our EPM environment. Uh, that issue took uh, too long to resolve for us 
to get where we needed to get with OAC in time for the October go live. So uh, by the time the, the OAC connection to EPM was resolved, uh, we had to focus on user acceptance testing and the eventual production cutover. So um, again, just just something you might want to you know talk to your Oracle sales manager about is you know what what's the timeline for the releases uh, of the next generation of, of the EPM cloud. I guess I'll, I'll end the presentation part by just talking about a, a look forward, right? So in terms of future phases, we already mentioned HFM and HTP being somewhere on that roadmap. None of our roadmap is, is firm yet. We're still working through that. Uh, obviously, I just mentioned OAC and, and the expansion of dashboards and data visualization uh, is, is nearest in front of us. Secondly, we would like to do a workforce planning assessment and possible implementation, depending on how that assessment goes. Uh, we're talking about creating a, a, a revenue cube. Uh, we did lay the foundation for getting revenue by customer and revenue by product. Uh, and so that's definitely something we're looking at. Uh, and it kind of relates to the next uh, future phase, a, a linkage into our sales and operations planning uh, solution out of the business units. Always room to expand our key performance indicators. So, so adding more KPIs is certainly uh, something we're looking at. And then further down the road, uh, beyond all that, probably taking a look at a costing system and some product profitability analytics. I'll pause there. Uh, I, I know in some of these forums, uh, some of the attendees submit questions ahead of the forum. So Kathy, I'll, I'll turn it back to you and, and see if you received any of those and if you wanna talk through any of that. Excellent, thank you. Thank you for that overview. Um, yeah, first question is, uh, what was Arconic's experience uh, with change management moving from Hyperion to EPM Cloud? Yeah, we talked about that a little bit, right? So it has been very uh, challenging. This was a step change uh, for us, uh, not, not just a, uh, an improvement a slight improvement. So again, we tackled change management in all the ways that we think we, we should have and could have. Um, we just have to keep emphasizing at this point that you know we've made a great investment toward our future. I mean, EPM gives us uh, the ability and flexibility necessary to you know, easily Im improve our processes and, and integrate different areas. Uh, we, we, we feel really <laughs> feel like we're not even uh, scratching the surface of what the system offers us yet. So we're excited to see, you know, how else we can, you know, we can expand our capabilities. But but for right now, it's, again, we talked about it a little bit. Change management is definitely uh, something not to overlook or ignore for this. Excellent. Um, how have your finance members adapted to the new tool? And what size is your internal support team for EPM? I'll, I'll preface my answers by saying, you know, I, I come from the technical side. So, so I'm, I'm just sharing, you know, my impressions on, on some of these questions coming from the, the functional finance side. But uh, the early returns are that, you know, EPM is, is user friendly and intuitive, uh, which, which makes the transition easy. Um, EPM is, is, is also brought a, a full world of possibilities for reporting. So we've already implemented narrative reporting uh, and look forward to deploying Oracle Analytics Cloud. And one of the other things that I'll mention uh, to you as well in terms of narrative reporting, uh, we really like the report bursting feature. So uh, what you can do with that is for, for the, the canned reports, you can uh, you know, determine who needs to see what report when uh, and without the, the users having to go out and, and pull down that report or run their own report, that report can be uh, bursted or delivered to their inbox uh, when they need it. And so, so we're, we're uh, but so in terms of that, you got to remember too, we're, we're still in that overlap parallel phase. So uh, some of these questions might be a little bit, um, uh, you know, preemptive, but uh, so far uh, it, it looks promising. Excellent. What is the post go live experience for both the IT team and the finance team? We, we talked a little bit about this as well. It, it, the, the post go live experience, um, there definitely was a stabilization period. 
So as I said, we went to production in late October. The, the first couple of months, uh, there, there was some noise, there was some churn, there were some performance things that had to be improved. There was some additional uh, training and understanding that, that we need to sh needed to share. It, you know, as with any large implementation like this, it, it, th there were some bumps early on, um, but we're, we're, we're really starting to settle down we're, we really feel like we're, we're past uh, the, the, the worst of that. And that's why we're looking very soon to cut over to EPM and EPM only. Um, Kathy, remind me, what was the second part of that question? Uh, that, the, it's, what was the post go live experience for both the IT, IT and finance team? Oh, no, I think, I'm sorry, I might be back to the prior question. You asked for the size of the support team? Oh, yes, yeah. Uh, for what is the size of the internal support team for EPM? Okay, so um, on on the technical side, uh, you know there is a, a Hyperion tech lead on my team uh, who works with the business process owner on the finance functional side, uh, and we, as I said earlier, we have the Oracle ACS organization uh, providing technical support, application technical support for us. So uh, I, for right now, that's the extent of the size of the support team uh, on the uh, IT side. Okay, so this uh, next uh, section is more focused on EDM. How has this improved your business? How has this helped organize and clean your data? And how, I know it's a long question, and how does it relate to your core GL data hierarchies? So uh, EDM has provided a, a, a centralized management of our outlines and our metadata. Uh, it's being leveraged to provide a, a more systematic and consistent solution across a number of the corporate solutions besides EPM. Um, we did take the opportunity in converting from that custom solution to EDM to do some cleanup of, of, uh, on the way into EDMCS. So that was a benefit as well. Uh, in terms of how it relates to the core GL data hierarchies, I, I'm probably not the best person to, to answer that one, but I can certainly get back on that. Okay, excellent. Um, was the Arconic user group part of the ideation requirements and build review? Uh, so, Yes, to a degree, right? So there are enough users across the corporation that we certainly couldn't involve everybody in all of those phases. Uh, we just had a, a representative group, uh, you know, strategically named to represent all interests. So, so yes, across all of those phases, there were users involved, but I, I don't want to give you the impression that it would have been too unwieldy and, and, and we, we never promised them we could implement every single idea anyway, but we kind of kept it to a, a manageable size group. But, but yes, uh, there was representation across all the user groups. Okay, and then um, the follow-up question on the EDM is to piggyback on the support question. Are there functional support super users? Does the finance organization have dedicated resources for EPM? And if so, how many? Um, I wouldn't say that they have dedicated EPM support people on the finance side. Uh, there are definitely people on the functional side who interact with all of the tools, uh, but really just in the path of their jobs, really in the flow of their jobs. It's not, uh, you know, a dedicated administrator or dedicated support person. No. Got it. Okay. Uh, do you have unique uh, business lines, products that need to be forecasted and analyzed differently than your core business? And if so, how did you build the system to manage those unique processes without distracting from the main functionality? Kathy, that's a great question. And, and again, coming from the technical side, I, I wouldn't do that answer justice, but I would be glad to follow up on that. Fantastic. Alrighty, next question. Uh, I am very, someone says, I'm very experienced with the planning and HFM FCC side of Oracle. Oracle EBS would be new to me. I've heard you mention Oracle EBS a couple of times. How long have you been using Oracle EBS? 
and what's your history experience with that? Yeah, so Oracle EBS is Oracle's Enterprise Resource Planning or ERP system. Uh, we've been using it since early 2000, uh, still using it. In fact, uh, we have an EBS modernization program going on right now uh, to where we're upgrading and, and, and modernizing our Oracle EBS system. So uh, again, longtime users of, of Oracle ERP and uh, uh, the, the roadmap has us using Oracle ERP uh, as, as far as we can see into the future. Great. Does the finance team feel empowered to make reports and leverage the full power of the EPM cloud? Uh, we sure hope so. Uh, as I said, <laughs> um, you know, we really feel like from a, a reporting standpoint uh, that that the users will will, you know, we, we're catering to both the casual users who wouldn't be intimidated by the reporting tools and the ability to develop reports. But we also feel like the power users, you know, we've set them up for success as well. So, again, maybe a little bit premature with that question. Uh, not sure we're doing a whole lot of that yet out in the field, uh, but, but we hope we've uh, laid the foundation of success for that. Fantastic. Um, Mike, can you speak to the choice of or expand on not implementing FCC in phase one and keeping HFM for your consolidation? Um, can I talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So, again, the proof of concept was was insightful. Um, you know, we 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 again have what we feel like is a world class closing consolidation process. And and so, when you when you step back and look at it, right, really, what was to be gained by by making HFM to FCC part of the phase one scope, right? We we just felt like. Uh, our on-premise solution was serving us well. Uh, we had the solution we wanted and, and it was well understood and it was functioning just fine. And, and to take that to the cloud as part of the first phase was really to take on a, a lot of risk without much potential reward because in the case of HFM, uh, best case scenario, it would just keep working. Right. It, it wasn't like it, it, you know, the process needed to be improved and the, and the technology was failing us. Uh, it, it was really a risk reward decision. And, and again, it's not that we won't ever consider, you know, taking HFM to FCC. It's just that we just didn't feel like we should break through the wall with with uh, HFM being part of that first first phase. And so uh, it was just a, you know, a, a calculated measured approach to to push that to a further phase. Okay, great. Um, next question. Do you have tight integration of your chart of accounts between Oracle, EBS, and EPM? Do you have select uh, selective segments or are all segments in your dimensions? Uh, Kathy, another question uh, I can follow up with our, our, our functional finance people on. Um, I, we, this is the first time we've had an enterprise data management solution. Our, our custom solution was really not built and designed to cover all the needs of the enterprise. Uh, and so you know, that's in front of us, right? We, we can certainly use EDMCS, um, leverage it more than we did our, our prior tool. There we go. Um, and I'm looking... Um... Can you elaborate on what were any difficulties you might have faced with the EDMCS solution? Kind of lessons learned, I guess. Yeah, I think what made EDMCS probably the most challenging track is not only the nature of it being such that it's, you know, it's, it provides the backbone of the rest of the solution, but the EDMCS module is probably the newest Right. So they're really and, and I'm not by no means am I, am I criticizing intro when I say this, but it, it, it's just that there really aren't a whole lot of people who have a whole lot of experience with with EDMCS. And and so, you know, that that's another reason why I feel like you got to give it extra attention and to keep it off the critical path uh, is because, um, you know, the world is still getting developing expertise and, and, and getting comfortable with it. Uh, and our, our requirements, though, I don't think particularly complex, 
uh, weren't simple and straightforward either. Uh, and so we, we, we did, you know, stumble a few times in the EDM CS space uh, and, and, and had to regroup and, and, and we got there. Uh, but, but I just think the fact that it's, it's, I believe one of the newer tools and it's only been out a few years and, and, and the world is still developing expertise in it. Okay, excellent. It looks like we have hit all the questions. Do you have any final comments that you'd like to make, Mike? Uh, no, I, I just uh, want to thank everybody for their time today. Like I said, I, I hope in, in covering the whole journey and a lot of different aspects of it, uh, we were able to leave everybody with something to take away, you know, based on where, where you are in your particular <coughs> journey. And I'm sure everybody's in a, in a different place. Uh, but uh, we feel really good <laughs> about being, you know, where we are as I said at the beginning, it's been a long road to get here and we still have a long way to go, but, but we feel like, uh, you know, we were really set ourselves up for, for future success and we're really excited to be uh, where we are. Well, fantastic. And we so appreciate your time and thank you everyone for attending today's live uh, client success forum. We are recording this. So if you would like to hear the, uh, the recording, please just shoot us a note. And that concludes today's call. And everyone have a fantastic rest of your day. And again, thank you so much, Mike. We really appreciate it.